homeowner whose fight to force developers to fix the flammable cladding on his home could result in a change to the law that could potentially help millions of people in unsafe flats or homes that they can't sell. When Steve Day received a bill for £40,000 to fix the flammable cladding on his flat in 2018, he rallied his neighbours at Royal Artillery Quays, a development on the Thames in London, and has been leading the fight ever since. Really pleased to be joined by Steve now. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Steve, let's just find out what the issue is with your building and its neighbouring blocks. Just explain as simply what the issues are. So we've got two main issues, one with our external walls and two with the internal walls. So starting with the external walls, the uh, walls have an expanded polystyrene external insulation and that's deemed unsafe as per the regulation changes uh, post-Grenfell. Um, now, that is compounded by the fact that the builders didn't install uh, this cladding um, and external wall system correctly, um, and that meant the builders didn't do their job at the time of build. So that's the second issue on the external wall. Now, in addition to that, we have issues with the fire stopping on our internal walls, and that's basically where the pipes and the wires go into the flat from outside in the hallway, and that basically wasn't sealed up properly, meaning it can't prevent the spread of fire going in to the flat from outside and vice versa. Now, as you reference, the huge bill that you've had is as a result of changes to building regulations, which have quite rightly come in since the Grenfell Tower fire. Um, many leaseholders have been caught up to with changes to regulations, but you would argue in your case that your block didn't meet building regulations in the first place, those dating back to when the block was built. That's right. And what we've done is we've had a look at the safety certification. So British Board of Agrimen creates something called a BBA certificate for a specific product and very specific about uh, the testing that's involved to basically certify that product as safe. So in the case of our external wall, we had a look at the render thickness that was used, the fixings and the adhesive pattern and we found there to be um, defects. So on the render thickness, it was meant to be six millimetres. It was, uh, in fact, four as per professional reports for the Building Safety Fund. Um, in some cases, it was even less than four. So that's a render thickness, uh, defects. Plastic fixings instead of metal fixings on the fire break. So anyone knows that uh, plastic's not a great idea with uh, uh, fire breaks. And uh, finally, the adhesive pattern uh, was basically just the wrong pattern. It was dot and dab instead of the grid system that was being used. Um, so those were the um, very specific issues which make the system unsafe. And we can say that because the approved documents, which are the building regulations, state that uh, even minute differences in render thickness, fixings and adhesive pattern can affect the fire rating of the system. So therefore... The British Board of Agreement certificate I mentioned earlier is no longer valid to say that the system that's been tested uh, is certifying the system that's installed because of these differences. Mm. And that's very serious because yeah. it's people's lives. And this level of detail, I doubt, looking at the reports we've seen from other blocks around the UK, that many around the UK will fit all of those uh, criteria exactly to the uh, safety certification. So, yes, I think there's big issues. What did you have to do in order to find out that your developer, that uh, Barrett, the builder, had, hadn't had met these requirements? Did you have to have uh, a series of independent tests done? Well, this is the thing. So, I mentioned the building safety fund. So, all blocks over 80 metres um, are invited to apply for grants from the government. And in order to apply for that grant, uh, the managing agent um, who's acting on behalf of the leaseholders and the building owner will basically commission a report to uh, look at the um, building and it will take samples in a survey and it will basically work out if the building met building regulations at the time of construction and also look at what is needed to be done to remediate that building up to the current regulations of the day so it does actually pass now. Um, so all buildings that have applied for the fund would be sitting on the evidence needed uh, to do this comparison and then all we did was take that a step further, use those reports and ask for the safety certificate from the builder and compare on those criteria that I mentioned earlier and that's how we basically convinced Barrett to pay out two substantial payments for RAC. So are you satisfied with what Barrett have offered? 
Well, I'm very grateful um, that they've offered it, but it's come at a huge cost. Um, it's taken me nine months of campaigning, 10,000 tweets. That's quite a lot of tweets. <laughs> that is a lot um, of tweeting. On the on the yes. toilet too, I understand, Steve. Um, no comment, but uh, <laughs> I, I wouldn't like to say the accuracy of that. But yes, I may have told uh, a certain reporter of yours that, <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, the serious side of it, yeah, it's taken over my life. Um, for nine months, it's put my business uh, under strain. The 1.3 million was paid um, in November, and we are grateful for that. But we had to campaign for them to cover, due to the fact we proved that there were defects in both the internal and external walls, that they should pay for everything. Um, and what they didn't realise was that the external um, wall system um, is attracting waking watch, um, and it's costing serious amounts of money, a large proportion of that doubling of the service charge. We're just spending on 24-7 yeah. fire wardens looking for fires because it's that dangerous. So what we've done in the last three weeks is managed to convince Barrett by putting more pressure on them reputationally to make another payment, which they did, and we're grateful for it. But what is wrong is that they've installed this external wall system on our building. It's defective the taxpayer will have to now pay the £30 million to fix that. Now, what our bill wants to do is to say, no, that's wrong. They should pay for the whole lot. And that's what we're campaigning for. With okay, the so this is the polluters, the polluter pay scheme. And the that's plan right, yeah. is to add it into the building safety bill, which um, we'll hear more about in the autumn. Again, we've heard various iterations of it. It's been in draft form. It's come out to a certain extent, but we're going to hear more of it. And you, you know, after all this campaigning, uh, Steve, you are meeting the government this week. Yes. What we need to do is we need to work out exactly any concerns the government has. We think it's the moral thing to do. It's basically saying, if developer or a cladding manufacturer doesn't do the right thing, so the builder doesn't install um, these wall systems correctly, doesn't do the internal compartmentation. But in the case of a manufacturer, they might have, uh, as we've seen in the Grenfell Inquiry, a fudge test, put insulation in tests with uh, fire barriers where they shouldn't have and so on to fudge the tests, then they'll pay for that. Basically, if people do the wrong thing and put people's lives at risk, we say, don't let them off with the tax, don't let them off with the levy, make them pay in full. If they don't exist, make their parent companies pay in full. So we're basically solving the problem of not having enough money. We need um, 15 billion as per the uh, Housing Select Committee. Um, we've got five on the table. We need another 10, but it's probably going to be more than that. So we say, let's get the money in from all these defective buildings so we can then leave the government to take on all the costs up front and give grants to buildings of all heights, not just the 18 metres, so we can take all of these interim, so we can shield these leaseholders from all this uh, liability that should not be on their plate and uh, were failed, basically, by the construction yeah. industry. And you That's think, what our bill does. Yeah, and you think the reputational damage for breaking rules means that most companies will settle? Well, we're not, <laughs> we're not reliant on that. No. Um, we're, it's a statutory scheme, so it's basically saying... We're going to remove limitations so they can't basically, um, you know, say they're timed out. And we're going to put a liability on them if uh, these reports for the Building Safety Fund or some investigations prove uh, this, uh, these buildings are unsafe and they broke regulations in force at the time of construction. And that's the key point. We're not making them guilty if they did the right thing. We're not changing the regulations. We're just removing that limitations. And that's basically going to mean that going forward, as well as the crisis now, that builders will have a large stick um, against them if they fail in their responsibility to build safe buildings going forward, because mm. they will be liable for the whole remediation cost. And it should prevent future Grenfells. Let's hope so. Um, I hope you get bought beers whenever you walk around the blocks in Royal Artillery Keys. I hope you're I hope you're famous in that area of South East London, Steve, for all that all that you've been doing. Um, you could well be the saviour of the cladding crisis. I mean, I know it's taken a huge chunk out of your life and you've mentioned that already. But what is it about you that's made you so determined 
to not only fight in for your block and for its neighbouring blocks, but also to try and take this to government to try and um, promote, try and provoke change for every leaseholder affected by this? Well, I, I basically have faith um, in Jesus. I'm a Christian and... Um, I felt led all the way through everything, and I've had I've got peers on my uh, WhatsApp. I've got lords. I've got MPs. I've got um, you know a few politicians from other parts of the world. Um, it's just been an absolute amazing journey, and I really felt. And you know, we've got forty bishops supporting us. I've got the Bishop of Kensington, Graham Tomlin. Um, he's a really good friend now, and he's helped me with this. And you know, just people are giving up their time. Experts, you know, Daniel Greenberg, the Parliamentary Council, he's 20 years writing the government legislation, um, you know, but in it, the House of Commons. But it takes a special person yeah. to bring everyone together, I think, Stephen. Yes, you can, that's, I'm a middleman. Well, middle you can congratulate <laughs> yourself for that. Um, best of luck when you meet with government on Wednesday. Um, keep us posted as well. We'd love to find out if this is as we hope, a really important turning point for those leaseholders caught up in this cladding scandal. Um, thanks so much for talking to us, Steve Day. Thanks, Steve. Thank you.